Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight I want to welcome Tim Derling to the channel. We are going to rank the albums of Canadian band Loverboy. So let's get started. Talking bands no one talks about. Grant's Rock welcome Warehouse. Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight we are going to rank the albums of Loverboy. Who is talking Loverboy for crying out loud? Well, we here are in the warehouse. I've got Tim Derling here. And he is ready to rank the albums of uh, Lover Boy. Tim Derling, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm doing good, Grant. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Lover Boy is one of the probably one of the first you know rock bands that I remember liking on the radio when I was quite young. So um, some of this music's been with me for a long time, but it, it was it was interesting to, to actually re-listen to the entire albums and uh, come up with. I'm curious what you come up with, and and you're probably curious what I've come up with. So well, it's uh, it's an interesting discography. Yeah, because a lot some of the stuff I hadn't heard, and when you know, I don't know when I get an idea to do something. God knows, it's just like sometimes I want to revisit these these bands, and I just haven't for a long time. This is kind of like one of those situations. But I've got the entire catalog. We're gonna look at the studio albums now they've put out a lot of best ofs we've talked about this before where they will put out a best of but they'll have like three tracks yeah. that they add to it that they've recorded they've done that three talking times. about three they've times done three different times yeah well we're not going to talk about those yeah. they've put out a lot of stuff and they've rehashed stuff so yeah. it's kind well, of a fragmented discography when you look at it so it is but we're, we're just trying gonna... to make some sense of it <laughs> Hopefully it'll make sense. So yeah. we're just looking at those albums that were really the studio albums. Yeah. Uh, no live albums, just the studio albums. All right. Yeah. So Lover Boy formed in 1979 in Calgary, Alberta. When they tried to get a record deal, they were rejected by many labels. They did sign to Columbia CBS records in Canada, and they started their first album in 1980. Um, Producer on that album was uh, Bruce Fairburn. Yep. And Bob Rock was yep. the uh, engineer. The dream team. The dream team. But we're going to talk about it. We are going to rank these albums. And, you know, Tim, I, well, that first album you think would be like golden to me, but there are other albums that I'm going to rank higher. The band, Mike Reno, lead vocals and, uh, well, lead vocals. He was from the band Moxie. Paul Dean, guitar backing vocals. He was in Street Heart. And then we got Doug Johnson, Scott Smith, and Mac Friente. So I'm not sure what their pedigrees were. Do you know anything about those other well, guys? Matt Burnett was also in Street Heart. He was but in I, Street Heart. But too. I don't okay. know, I don't know if he was on as many albums as Paul Dean was. So um yeah, like Street Heart was one of those bands, like they were like well, West Coast Canadian bands. They signed to Atlantic. They had a couple albums out on Atlantic, and they never did really much uh, south of the border like a lot of Canadian bands. This is this is important to to, to discuss. Like Loverboy right. did what so many Canadian bands weren't able to do, and they broke big in the states. I mean, for most of the eighties, I mean, they had they were big four platinum albums and a gold album, and then a gold best of in right. the U.S. So. That's what bands like Helix and Honeymoon Suite and so many of these bands were unable to do. Loverboy did it. But exactly what we've talked about before. And Loverboy never moved to the States. No, and they, they, they were that. always they always identified as a Canadian band. I, I used to think they were from Vancouver, but I think they were based in Vancouver. But initially Well, they're, they're based in, in Vancouver now. But Yeah. Uh but the thing is that they never moved to the States. And you know, we've been on nope. shows with Martin. And you, yeah. we've talked about it. The he's, bands that have made it, he's, Canada, moved to the states. Lover he's, boys. He, he's exception. right, and usually, usually you have to go where, you know, where the big markets are. But I think in Lover Boy's case, they had Bruce Allen managing. He was a well-known manager. He had he had clout in the industry, uh, and Lover Boy, you know, they opened so many doors. They they weren't the first. I think Prism was the first, but they were one of the first bands to record some of Brian Adams' earliest songs mm -hmm. uh, before he broke big. Um, and and Bruce Fairburn and Bob Rock, I mean, they became the most in-demand production team at the late 80s with Bon Jovi and Aerosmith. And then Bob Rock becomes a producer in his own right, Motley Crue, Metallica, The Cult. 
lover boy never gets that credit and lover boy also like martin also did an episode i think of his podcast history and five songs like did canada invent hair metal well lover boy kind of set that template for melodic rock bands getting on the radio mm -hmm. and uh, i don't think they've ever gotten the credit for it no i don't think so either Loverboy had a lot of different influences that you will hit about. We'll talk yeah. about these during the show, but uh, we're going to rank the uh, eight albums as we see it. Yeah. There are more records, but we're just talking the studio albums. So yeah. we're going to do all eight and give our rankings. And then uh, hopefully, well, Tim will agree with me. All we're trying to do is turn you on to music here. That's all we're yeah. trying to do. They, they, they might have more albums than you think they had. They do. And a lot of people yeah. think, oh, my God, I, I stopped in like 1984 or 83 yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, there's way more to Loverboy than just that. So all we're trying to do is turn you on to stuff. Maybe you want to seek out these records. Hey, maybe you don't want to. Maybe you're not a Loverboy fan, but maybe you could be turned on to being a Loverboy fan. We're just here talking music. So, yeah. Tim Derling, thank you for coming on. Let's start out with your number eight. Okay, so this is maybe low hanging fruit, yeah, but maybe. uh, and it's not strictly a studio album in that the guys went to the studio for a few months or a year, came up with an album. This is a mixture of songs over the years, but none of them had ever been released before. This is called <laughs> Unfinished Business. Uh, okay, Unfinished Business 74 to 14. This came out in 2014. Uh, they put it out on their own label, and it's a mixed bag, right. But what I really have tried to find out about this release grant is that, and usually bands are pretty good at this stuff. Like this has lyrics and it's got credits, but what it doesn't have is detailing where each of these songs originated. It says they were written between 1974 and 2014, recorded between 1979 and, and 2014, but it doesn't say, it doesn't have the individual, you know, because I can listen to these and they sound like they were recorded at all different times. So I would like to know more about the songs on here. I think there are some decent songs on here. There are some kind of uh, songs on here. But one of the more interesting ones on here is a song called War Bride, which is this 619 epic of the song. And uh, lyrically, it's that's kind of what it's about. And uh, it doesn't sound like anything that Loverboy ever did before or since, lyrically. No. No. Uh, so, you know, there's there's stuff on here that reminds me of Keep It Up era. There's stuff that reminds me of Wild Side era. I don't know. I wish I knew where these songs originated from. So that's kind of annoying to me. Uh, that and the fact that, you know, some of the songs aren't really that great. That's why it's at the bottom. See, I rated it a bit higher, but that's okay. This is why we're doing this. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I expected this is one of those records that uh, I didn't have, but I ordered it off the Loverboy site. You can buy it. It's plenty available. Anybody yeah. looking for a later Loverboy, don't go out on Discogs. Don't go out on eBay. Go to the Loverboy site because they have they have CDs available. Just yeah. giving yeah. you a tip. Get it right from the band. Yeah. Get it right from the band. Support the band. Yeah. Um. I rated this a bit higher though, but it uh -huh. is a mixed bag, but I wasn't aware that it was compiled from different eras. I get that they're, you know, why not put out all this stuff from back in the day? And Oh yeah. I, I'm, I'm all for putting it out. I just wish that they annotized it better and said, this was written for the keep it up sessions. This was written for the wild. I, sessions. I agree. And then there's none of that in there. It's up to the, but you can tell. Ha ha. I, I didn't really think about it much, but you can tell what came from what if you really listen to it. You know, um, what, gives me, you know what gives it away on some of them, Grant, is the keyboard sounds. Oh I like that God. sounds like keep it up, but that sounds like get lucky. Yeah, because yeah. you'll go from analog keyboard sounds to digital. And it's yeah. like when you hit those digital keyboard sounds, it dates it so badly. Yeah. Well, I rated this a lot higher. My, uh, I'm going to go with my number eight. And my yeah. number eight, maybe this is maybe this is wrong, maybe this isn't isn't, but we all hear things differently. I'm gonna go with uh, Wild Side from 1987. This was when Bruce Fairbank came back into the fold. He couldn't produce the previous record. He was busy. They brought him back, but I think it was too late because I look at Bruce as the producer as their 
he is basically their uh, Terry Brown, the way I yeah. look at oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Because all that early stuff was all produced by him, and there's magic there. Now, by the time 1987 comes around, he comes back to the fold, but I think it's too late. Um, this is like the first record that didn't go platinum in the States. Um, I don't know. It, it When I listen to this record, I don't know what you, you haven't ranked it yet. But when I hear it, it sounds like the band is tired and they're running out of gas to some degree. And I think there's a lot of things at play here. Musical taste. We're talking 1980, 87. Yeah. Hair metal's taken over. Just lover boy really fit in there do they really know how to fit in with that scene probably not i don't know um i'm just throwing it out there ladies and gentlemen we want to hear from you in the comments let us know what you think about this record we do want to know uh but i think when i listen to this record mike reno tim still sounds great oh yeah oh yeah yeah but mike reno can't save a drowning ship i'm just saying he's great is it the material? Is it the timing? I think there's a lot here that go against Lover Boy. The other thing that drives me crazy is the bad 80s drum sound. Now you mentioned some of the sounds on this on this CD, and I think some of those could be tied to Wild Side because they're the same drum so. sounds. Yeah. I think and so. That's, yeah, I think so. I wish they would have recorded real drums on uh hi-fi but that's you know i'm nitpicking i'm just saying um but i just think that they've lost their sound on this record even though bruce is back in the chair i think time has passed i think had he returned with the previous record things might have been different what i have no idea i'm just thinking he's their terry brown ladies and gentlemen yep. he's a roy he's thomas still... baker he's their jeff blixman he's their guy Right. He was the guy, so. But you've got Notorious, which is, I think it's a decent track. It's probably the best track on the record. Um, also, I think Read My Lips on this record, I think is pretty good. It's dated sounding. See, the other thing is with this record, I think it really sounds dated. When you listen to the early records, yeah, they have a lot of new wave elements. Could they be considered dated? Yes, but they seem to... I don't want to use the word wear better, but they seem to translate better into the two, you know, in our, in 2024, they seem to translate better. Um, all the songs on, um, uh, all the songs on worldwide are kind of, they just kind of lay there. I'm not saying the band doesn't sound great, but I think the songwriting could be better. I don't know. Hometown hero, hometown hero with Brian Adams. He helped co-write that. I think that's a decent track. But for the most part, I don't think this album delivers. So that's why it's my number eight. And it's funny because, you know, you already mentioned this, but to me, because of some of the other tracks on here, I think it delivers more. But anyway, that's my number eight. So I can tell we're going to have some some differences, but that's good. That's that's why we, we do all this. hear things differently, and that's why we do yep. these. Yeah, that's so, the beauty uh, of it. All right, Tim, what's your number seven? I can hardly well, wait. So my number seven, um, and this seems low, but I mean it's a it's it's not a big catalog, right? Right. So my number seven is six. See, oh, I rated that much higher. <laughs> Lover Boy Six from nineteen. Now, 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 cap, you know, keep in mind, um, like you, like I said, it's a brief catalog, and some of the, my ratings are by degrees. Right. You know. Um, well, you know what, Tim, before we like, before we go on, we should probably say this. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but there's really nothing in the Loverboy catalog that's yeah, really bad. It's pretty it's really consistently like, you know, they they didn't they never had an album where they just did this weird left turn and everybody's no. like, what is this? Everything's it's, everything's it's very consistent. gradual. You except, know it's them. Right. Yeah, you always know it's them. And I gotta say, you know, I've seen Loverboy twice. I saw them last year and I saw them in 2016 and um, Mike Reno, you might look at him and say, wow, he's still out there doing it. Yeah. And he, he still is. sings pretty good. Yeah. Um, the only thing that if, if you've never seen Loverboy live, they sound good live. The tempos are slowed down. Oh, really? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's to accommodate Mike. Like, for example, the last two times I saw them, they opened with Notorious. Okay. And, no and Notorious is like, dun, 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 dun. that's how it is on the album. You go see them live, it's more like, dun, 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 dun. it's more deliberate, it's slower. But whatever it is, he's able to sing in their original keys. So I'm saying, like, you know, if you get a chance to see Loverboy in the theater somewhere or if they're opening for a bigger band, don't miss them. They still deliver live. Well, okay, so you know, at least what I've noticed on a lot of these records, he still delivers. And yeah. you can it's and he's got that unmistakable voice. Unmistakable because he's a brilliant anywhere. he's a brilliant singer. He yeah. can handle anything that you throw at him because some of these records that we're looking at are CDs, whatever you want to say. I'm gonna call them records anyway. He really pushes himself, even on these yeah. later records, and yeah. you're sitting there listening to it going, Oh man. yeah, he's not on there intoning everything. And this this is a good album. Um, this was yeah. the first, um, it was the first whole new album in 10 years, but it was the first new music they put out since the three tracks they did in 89 that came out on the Big Ones compilation. And uh, this was when a lot of these older bands, these 70s and 80s bands were signing with CMC International, like Warrant and and uh, Dawkin and Slaughter. And then a lot of bands that came before, like, like Loverboy, like uh, Leonard Skinnerd. And so Loverboy, this is the only one they did. And I remember I remember reading that they had an album out and being surprised and being like, wow, you know, I I wasn't sure if they were back together. I think that there are some really good songs on here. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly don't think it's a bad album. I think Love of Money is a really cool, like, down-tuned kind of groover of a song. Not grunge down-tuned, but it's just, it's a it's a really low tuning. Waiting for the Night's a great song. Um one of my favorites on here is actually more of a bluesy song called Create a Monster, which a little bit of trivia. Paul Dean did a solo album. We well, did a couple solo albums at least, but yeah. he had a solo album in 1994. And Create a Monster was on that originally. So this is redone with Reno on vocals. Spin in My Wheels is classic sounding lover boy. That could have been from one of the 80s albums. Big Picture is a good one. Yeah, it's a good album. It's a good album. I just had to put it somewhere. And for me, right. it came in at number seven. So wow. we're seeking out. I don't know how easy this is to find now, but we're checking out uh if you go on discogs i think there's plenty of them yeah the, the other records that are hard, the later albums that are hard to find but this i think anybody interested could find these so the only thing you got to make sure it's a little bit like white snake make sure double check make sure you don't have it already <laughs> because most of their album covers look at or some this, combination or this yeah, some combination of red white and black <laughs> or this right. yeah 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 again red white and something Right. So yeah, anyway, yeah. So All yeah, right. that was my number seven. That was your number seven. All right, yeah. let me scroll up to see where I'm at on my. I'm gonna go with unfinished business for my mm -hmm. number seven. This to me is uh, well, you I rated it at number seven. You rated it even lower, but it's a step backward when we're gonna compare it to just getting started because well, we'll get to just getting started. Yeah, but I think it's going backwards because yeah you, you mentioned that there's a lot of tracks on here that came from an earlier time but we've got drum machines we've yeah. got gang vocals gang vocals drive me up the wall if anybody's ever watched I know. any shows gang vocals drive me crazy there's a lot of very late sounding 80s dated production techniques so some of these I sound like demos though, to me Greg. They Somebody could be demos, demos, but I think for the most part, it all kind of blends together and it works. But fire me up. We've got drum machines, gang vocals, not very good, very late sounding, but I think it's a good track to lead the, the, the album off. Why this wasn't up on Wildside, I, that, I think that's where that's from. That should have been Probably. on that record. Yeah. Um, sounds like a kiss. Guitar sound good, but I kind of giggle at the song. Counting the Nights, kind of proggy synths, but it's a good track. Ain't such a bad thing. Nice to hear synths back at this level, but it's filler. Yep. This is one of the things in these later Loverboy CDs that kind of drive me crazy, is that the synths kind of take a back seat. And, you know, the thing about Loverboy, at least when I listen to him, when you listen to that golden era, it's equal Mike Reno. The yeah. scents are always predominant, but the scents are always tasteful and mm -hmm. very well executed. And the guitars. 
Everything's very well balanced. So at least on this, it's nice to hear those synths come back. I'm just saying. Compared I think to, they did a pretty good job at, at, at mixing it in such a way so that yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sound the volume levels are the same. It doesn't, yeah. you know, I it's it's I just wish there was more information about the songs. Right. I don't think it's a bad album by any no. means, but it's not the level that we're going to eventually hit. But, you know, for a legacy band, okay. But at least they're giving the, the, I guess the important thing is they're giving the fans some of these tracks that have been some, forgotten. Some of these legacy acts just don't do new music. So at least we got something. We got something. Yeah. All right. So anyway, so there you go. That's my uh, number seven. Uh, Tim, what's your number six? So my number six, so far we're kind of close. Because my number six is Wild Side. And, you know, I did not realize, I've had this album since like, pr practically it came out, at least the cassette. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that where it says Lover Boy and Wild Side, these are not exact triangles. They're wavy like a banner or something. Like they're not exactly straight. I did, I did not realize that until today when I dug this out. Um, so, I, yeah, I got a lot of thoughts about this. This, um, like I said before, I think that Loverboy had a really big influence on a lot of bands that came after them. Mm -hmm. I know they inspired a lot of Canadian bands because they said, hey, it's possible to break, right? Um, yeah. But they also had a big influence on bands like Bon Jovi that did become popular. As a matter of fact, Notorious is essentially a Bon Jovi song. I mean, John John and Richie co-wrote it. but It sounds um, like it. And it sounds like it. It was the only, <laughs> excuse me, top 40 single off of this. But um, the problem is, and this happened to a lot of bands in 1987, 1988, 1989, the bands that weren't exactly hard rock bands. So I'm going to mention, and these are all bands I like, mm -hmm. 38 Special, Night Ranger, Survivor. Uh, um, there's a ton more that are just, I'm blanking on. But um, right. band, the bands that weren't exactly hard rock, but had influences on those hard rock bands that came later, the, you know, the hair metal, if you want to call it that, it just wasn't their time anymore, and they were being overtaken by these bands. So right. the fact that they managed to get this album out, and it still went gold, you know, all of their major label studio albums certified. That's kind of cool. So what we had here for singles, um, Notorious was a uh, like number thirty eight hit. I really liked Love Will Rise Again. I I thought that was a really catchy song. It was a single, but it didn't it didn't do anything. But what's interesting is that. It, it, I didn't notice this until years later. I mean, as anyone knows who knows me at all, I'm a huge Y&T fan. So what Love Will Rise Again has, the connection with Y&T is a songwriter named Taylor Rhodes. Taylor Rhodes is a well-known song doctor. If you, you know, he's not as well-known as, say, Desmond Child or Jim Valens, mm -hmm. but you'll see his name here and there. So Taylor Rhodes co-wrote Love Will Rise Again, I think, with Paul Dean. He co-wrote the song Contagious with Dave Benichetti for Y&T. If you play those songs back-to-back, -back, forget the fact that there's keyboards, uh, on the Loverboy track, dun, 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 they're very, very, very similar songs. Wow. This is the same year, 1987. But I'm a sucker for those kind of songs, so I, I was okay with it. Um, I think this album runs out of steam pretty fast. I mean, I'm a big Brian Adams fan, especially his 80s stuff. I, Hometown Hero is a weak song to me. I, it's, it's almost like they wanted, they were trying to recapture that magic of earlier, and it just, this isn't the song. I, I, I never, I never cared for it. Um. I think Can't Get Much Better is pretty good. Walking on, I pretty much like All the Side One. Read My Lips. Now that song, if you listen to that song, and then you fought forward two years to 1989 and listen to the Kiss song on Hot in the Shade called Read My Body, mm -hmm. I think Paul Stanley must have heard that this song. It's Read My, like it's very similar. You I don't know, think either of them are all that great a song, but I'm just saying. It's funny you should mention that because in my notes, I, and I don't think it was necessarily on this album, but I wrote down, this sounds just like a Kiss record, like off of something later. Yeah. I, I um, Obviously, I think Kiss were tapped into what uh, Loverboy was doing. But, well, you know, I, mean, I think, yeah, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know. It'd be pretty hard not to. I think, I think Loverboy opened for Kiss early on but I, I could be wrong. But probably. another thing, this is probably one of the first cassettes I ever bought because I wasn't buying CDs in 87, 88. I was just starting a music collection. That's one of the first cassettes I bought that had a bonus track on it. 
The very last song of the cassette's called Don't Keep Me in the Dark, which is kind of a ballad that doesn't really do much. It's not on the record. It's only on the cassette and CD. Yeah, That's one of the first that. times that, that ever I ever found that happen. So I don't think it's a bad record. I mean, Bob, Bob, it's probably one of the last times that Fairburn and Rock worked together as a production engineering team. It would have either been this or Permanent Vacation. They both came out in like fall 87 but, because but, after that bob rock broke away and became a producer in his own right but you know what's funny tim is that there's so much difference between this record and the first album which okay was, yeah was the you same. know what it is it's like night and day this album is the bruce fairburn bob rock sound that you get on slippery when wet and new jersey and you get on honeymoon suite big prize um it is not the Bruce Fairburn production of the first three. No, it, it's like it. It's like the influence. Be, the influencers became the influenced, yeah. and and like I said, you know, all of these classic rock bands. There's peaks and valleys. It just wasn't Lover Boy's time in the spotlight anymore. But they'd already, you know, what they did up until then. They left such a legacy. That's how they're able to go out now on the road and still have people go and see them. So and I don't that, think it's a bad record. It's no. just not as consistent as what's to come. It's my number six. But think about it. I know God, we are just going on a tangent, but think about it. Lover boy. The first album came out in 1980. We're going to 1987. What a good run. Oh yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, amazing run for a Canadian band that never transplanted themselves here in the States. Fantastic run. I don't, other than rush, I really can't think of another Canadian, maybe triumph, but I don't, think so lover boy sold way more I way more triumph. than lover boy yeah. sold way more albums than triumph yeah triumph had, more had, had, had more albums in april wine but like yeah. yeah lover boy were a huge success story for canada and i'll tell you a real quick story when i first started really paying attention to the top 40 radio grant there mm -hmm. was an american station i listened to all the time and they played lover boy all the time and i remember being shocked when i found out that lover boy were canadian because I grew up, you know, I, I still live right on the border of, of between New Brunswick and Maine. I've always listened to Canadian radio and American radio, kind of in equal mm -hmm. doses. And there were just certain bands that you just knew they were Canadian and n n nobody knew about them anywhere else, you know, like right. or very few people did like Kim Mitchell and Gowan and, you know, people like that. But Loverboy got played on this station I used to listen to all the time, every bit as much as The Cars or Huey Lewis. Oh, or, yeah. Or, anybody that was had and when i found out they were canadian that was a real proud moment for me i'm like they're canadian mm -hmm. so but they've never yeah they never relocated and they've always identified as canadian and i'll tell you what they are good for they are great ambassadors for um for classic rock on both sides of the border because they can go down into the states and play with the biggest you know their their peers from the 80s and then they can come up here in canada and headline and uh, like i said last time i saw them was it was great because kim mitchell opened that was a that was a great double bill. I really enjoyed that. So, mm -hmm. um, and they're you know they don't move. They never were that mobile on stage, right? There's not a lot of movement. They're just really really good, right? Well, and they're, they're all good players. So, and and the cool thing is too, Grant, is that they're mostly intact, other than Scott mm -hmm. Smith, who died tragically in in I think right the year two thousand. He was lost at sea. They replaced him with Spider Sin Abe. Mm -hmm. It's it's four of the five guys that were there from the beginning. So. Right it's not like mike reno and a bunch of like who's that guy who's that guy you recognize these guys and they're still intact today so you have yeah. to hand it to them yeah all right cool well i guess i'm to my number six and number, my you right? get your number six the my number six and i'm gonna go with uh well i don't have to throw it up there i'll throw the graphic up i'm gonna go with loving every minute of it now you're thinking grant what the heck well Hey, th this record really kind of lost it for me. Yes, there are some great things on here. Uh, this was came out in August of 1985. Tom Olam, who, if anybody knows who that is, he did a lot of work for Judas Priest. Basically, they're Terry Brown, but this was produced by Tom and Paul Dean. But there's a lot of production things here that drive me crazy which also show up here which leads me to believe that these some tracks on uh loving every minute of it are related to here right anything you hear gang vocals on on here probably come from loving every minute of it 
and this just drives me nuts because I hate gang vocals. But they tried to get Bruce Fairbain back on, but he was busy or something. So they got Tom Hollum on here as a replacement. I don't think he does really a bad job. I'd rather have had Bruce Fairburn on here, but whatever, that's fine. Um, loving every minute of it is, uh, well, in the, that's a Mutt Lang song, right? Co-wrote? Yep. Oh, it, he wrote it himself. It's solely just spread to Dan. Bang. It sounds like it. And I, I do think that this is the obvious single, but when I listen to it, I'm just going, something's just not, something's off. You know, is it the produ Bruce production that's not here? Is it the changing of the times? I don't know. Something's just not right. Steal the Thunder. The other thing I want to mention before I go on is that there are a lot of songs on here that have multiple writers. And yeah, I don't true. know if Loverboy's running out of ideas. Did they use up all their great stuff on the other albums? A lot of other bands have the same story. They lose up, you know, they have all their, their whole lives to write that first album. And by the time they get to the fourth, fifth album, they don't have any ideas. Cheap Trick's a good uh, example. But Steal the Thunder, gang vocals, I look at that as filler. Friday Night, filler. There's a lot of filler. Uh, this Could Be the Night is a nice ballad. You know, Mike Reno can sing everything. He sounds wonderful on this record. Oh, written by Jonathan Cain. Jonathan Cain. We've got Jonathan Cain coming in. Yeah. Uh, but it's a nice ballad. It's not offensive or anything. Um, Destination Heartbreak, another ballad. But the other thing that I think on this record, you can you can tell me what if I'm out of my mind, but when I'm listening to these guys, I don't think they've been hammering it out since 1980. Album, tour, album, tour. On this record, they sound kind of tired to me. Not as inspired as they used to be. Yeah, there's some decent stuff on here, but I don't know. It's just something's missing, and I can't put my finger on it. I don't know. But I know you've rated this higher, so you may look at this differently. But for me, they sound tired. The songs aren't quite here. Bruce is not producing. I don't know. I don't know. That's just the way I look at it. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah. my number five, my number five people are going to go, huh? What? Huh? Well, I listened to these all like leading up to this. And this is what I came up with. And again, you know, we're we're already in the top five. So right. these are not that we are. I'm going with the debut. Oh. On this rather oh, weathered God. copy, this rather weathered eight track, I might add. You rated it. I'm not right. hey, I, this is why I like doing this because it's now, a fun so here's thing, thing. But I, mean, I have to hear what you've got to say because I rated so it a lot higher. This has, I mean, this has two evergreen lover boy songs. Kid is hot tonight and the epic that has turned me loose. I mean, those are just bulletproof songs. They're you can't, bulletproof. Um, but even when you go see the band live, they never do anything else from this album. And so I get thinking about that, and I get, look, I, I get thinking about, well, how do the rest of the songs on here go? So I'm listening to it. It's The, the cool thing about Loverboy is that, yeah, I, and I think people tend to forget this, they did have a little bit of that new wave. Just, just a little bit. Not, they, not as much as, say, the Cars, but just a little bit. No, of a but one. I'm going to disagree with you just a bit. If you listen to that first album, either though, even though there's a a lot, there's some new wave elements on the later records. You're not going to get any more new wavy than you are on the first record. It's oh, really no, a perfect I mean, blend. Lady, Lady of the eighties, uh, little girl, um, you know? Yeah. But there's uh, a lot of new wave on here, but I think it's a perfect blend of new wave and 70s style rock because we're talking 1980 so there's yeah. a little bit of you know but there's way there's a lot of new wave once you really look yeah. at it and analyze really, really it. Is. the keyboard never... sounds are very new wavy yeah i mean like anybody thought if anybody puts this on and is thinking bruce fairburn production as in the late 80s they don't no. get it the, no. it's very cool the drums are it's very close mic it's great i mean like i said you can't oh it sounds great yeah <laughs> you can't argue with you know Kid is hot today and trim me loose. I no. never liked Prissy Prissy. That song has always driven me up the wall. It's, yeah. it's bratty. It's got a lot of new wave on that track, though. It's Those the yeah. keyboards, very new wavy, you know. So 
yeah like this is a classic album who am i to criticize it i'm sure i'm going to get a lot of heat for it but that's all um, right but anyway yeah also this is a i remember seeing this record before i heard it when i uh, i must have had cousins that had it so yeah. i thought that was lover boy i thought lover boy was one person well that's not even a guy that's right. that i can't i can't remember her name she was a photographer but anyway um anyway and and you can't tell from looking at this because it's all weathered but the lyrics are typewritten almost like cheap trick style are typewritten and mixed in on this album cover but yeah um that's my that's my number five but like i said none of you know there's no stinkers in these albums that's just that's going to be my way out there opinion well you know lover boy is one of those bands where they they started out with a decent you know debut album but they rapidly improved with each record to a certain degree yeah to a certain yeah. degree so here, the thing about that too is like you talk about the success story in the states um i just found this out today this album came out in canada in august of 1980 it didn't come out in the states till october that might have been when cbs us got picked them up i'm not sure that debut lover boy album sold two million copies in the states i mean that's unheard of for an unknown canadian band that that's a pretty good start they hit it Tim, they hit it right at the right time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of this with these bands is timing. Yeah. Because I don't know how much push they got in the States as far as marketing. But I just remember back in the day when I was a wee lad, this record, or at least certain tracks, Kid Is Hot Tonight, Turn Me Loose, everywhere. They were playing it all over. It just filled, evidently it filled a void. And really, it's just about timing. And Loverboy timed it perfectly, you know? Yeah. And those two songs, I mean, The Kid Is Hot Tonight has a little new wave to it. Right. But Turn Me Loose, Turn Me Loose was a pretty rocking song for 1980 to hit mm -hmm. the, the top 40 airwaves. So I think people had an appetite for something that was catchy but had some guitar in it. Oh, yeah. It's so, perfect. Yeah. All right, cool. So... I'm on my, remind me, am I on my number You're on five? your number five. Okay, my number five. I am going to go with six. Um, the thing is, this is the first new material since 1987. They've had a lot of time to get their energy back up from, you know, wildlife and all that. Uh, the thing is, this is the last album before Scott Smith died yep. in that boating accident in 2000. This to me, though, you could disagree, but we're just talking music. This sounds more like a follow up to keep it up than what came after. It's like if you, you know, keep it up and then put this out, this scene would be like a more natural progression than what really occurred to me. Mike Reno sounds just a bit older, where well, he's 10 years older, but he yeah. still delivers, sounds refreshed. The band, to, to me, sounds refreshed after the break. There's no dated instrumentation here. The drums on this record are real. Keyboard sounds sound very analog. It doesn't reach the heights of Get Lucky, even though we haven't talked about it, but we will. I don't know how you're going to rate that, but I rate Get Lucky pretty damn high. Uh, but you know what? I don't think this record's that bad. There are probably some half-baked songs on here, but for the most part, the good moments on the record outweigh the weak moments. Big picture, decent opener, love of the money, Reno singing in a lower register, but delivers. He goes right back into his registered natural high end later in the track. It's great. Secrets is a ballad with keyboard strings, well-recorded, nice song, very intimate, good recording. The other thing I want to mention is that this record really sounds good. Yeah. It's one of those yeah. records where you could put it on, you have a good system, and it sounds like the band is right there with you. Yeah, like a lot of these CMC records, they sounded like low-budget productions. And this was just produced by Paul Dean and Mike Reno, but it sounds yeah. good. It, it, it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you get a lot of ballads. You get a lot of rockers. You get a lot of variation in the Loverboy canon. I don't mind it. Uh, it's a it, Compared to what came before, this is very refreshing. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I like it. There are more records I like better than this, but I don't. It's, it's I, definitely worth checking out. And it was, exactly. you know, none of those CMC, you know, they didn't stand a chance, right, on, on that label, right? So they're all worth mm -hmm. checking out. Pretty right. much 
you know, a lot of those bands, they were still making good records. It's just the major labels weren't interested anymore. But, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. And I, I'm kind of agreeing with you a little bit. Like, this album, to me, wouldn't have sounded out of place had it come out in 91 or 92 if they no. stayed together and just done the next Loverboy record. But, you know, 97, that's fine. You know, uh, at that point, there wasn't a lot of traditional melodic rock like this coming out. So I was all for it when it came out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I dig but, it. Not bad. So I to what, my number four? Number four. We've, uh, it, it's been held up. And again, it's another uh, color variant. Uh, well, there is no color variant. <laughs> in 2007, they, they released their albums in the years that ended with seven, three times. But anyway, just getting started. Um, oh. This might be, you know, and, 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 and Grant hasn't talked about it either, but this is a really strong. Oh, my God. Latter day Loverboy album. Eh? The one that got away. Uh, Did we, uh, wait a minute. We said this is our number four, right? Yeah, this this okay, is my well, number. Okay, well, you this and I can number. present together, Tim, because okay, so that is the, also okay, my number four. Like, this is we'll a knock really these out strong, together. This oh, is a really God. strong album. Oh, and my God. I had no expectations of it. I, I didn't know anything. I Oh, Loverboy of an album. It's on Rockstar Music. Never heard of before. Never will again. Um, and uh, this is the first studio album they did with Spider on bass. It yeah. sounds great. I don't mm -hmm. recognize it. was produced by somebody named Anthony Anderson and Steve Smith, not Steve Smith, the drummer. But it sounds good. It sounds really good. Um, they, again, like Six, this is another album I, I don't think enough people even know about. And it's worth checking out. It's really good. It's really strong. Well, you mentioned just getting started. That almost sounds like part two of Working for the Weekend. If you There's think a lot it's of classic, very like, similar. I hear, I hear bits of The Kid Is Hot Tonight. I hear that yeah, too. There's I think like that was a... very much on purpose. Just but... to say, hey, it's us. But when you listen to it, Tim, it's like, oh my God, Lover Boy's back. It takes yeah. you right back. You know what it's, I mean? Yeah, uh, it's it's pretty good. It's it's I, I was, you know, when when these older bands do these albums, you're always a little bit hesitant, but then you hear it and it's good, you're like, oh, what was I worried about? But yeah, yeah I mean, really, you've, really you've strong. Got a, you've got a lot of different songwriters on this record, too. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Maybe they're running out of ideas. I don't know. But they, I think Black, they've always if you look throughout their their catalog there's always been outside songwriters to an extent just maybe not to the you know to the yeah. to the extent that it, it, it became but it, it also it, none of them sound out of place let's put it this no. way none of them don't sound like lover boy so the sequence okay this is what the sequencing is good now you have a lot of different styles but for some reason because the material is so good the songwriting so good the production is good when you listen to it, you can go, you can jump from styles, different styles to different styles, and it works. On paper, yep. you might look at it and go, well, that's not going to work. For some reason on this record, it works. And it just has to be the quality of the material and the production. Uh, it's the only thing I can contribute to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, we could go into tracks, but believe us, really, this is really a great latter day lover boy album. yeah if anybody picked up their best of that they put out in 2009 it's called uh greatest hits the real thing the song the real thing was on this first so you'd know that song anyway if you had that song. but yeah both of these these independent they're, they're both really really good albums. very like, good yeah. yeah no yeah i will give this a notch over six yeah me too this just, it seemed like everything is working in their favor on this. And you know what's sad about this, Tim, is that no one knows about this record. It's on a little label. It, it, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, <laughs> Frontiers picked them up for that rock and roll revival, but right I really would have step with them. Yeah, that's another one of those three new songs, a bunch of re-records. They did that once, but they did that again, too. But and we're, um, and we're not covering this because, really, what's there really to cover? It's... Yeah. The three new songs the are decent enough. And they re-recorded the song so they don't have to pay Sony for royalties. It, it's yeah, as simple I as that. I get it. I get but it. But I wish Frontiers had picked them up long term uh, because it, it's a little bit more than having these little tiny labels put your album up. Because for one, and I know we've probably talked about that. We are just going to go on a tangent. I know we've probably talked about Frontiers, but the thing with Frontiers is that they know how to take these these legacy acts, repackage them, and most of those records just the, the the artwork the booklets yeah. are top notch they treat these legacy artists like they're well 
I don't want to say gods, last, but the, the you know what I mean. Night Ranger albums all on yeah. Frontier. Brilliant. Really, really, really good. Really good. Uh, really strong. And these and and an album like Just Getting Started is worthy of that higher profile. Right. So I agree. So anyway, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our uh, number four. Yeah. Uh, What's your number three? My number three came out in uh, 1983. It's this little album right here. Keep it up. See, see, I rate that higher. Um, But again, this is number three. This is a U.S. uh, Columbia house, by the way. That's why it's got the blue. Oh, the blue. Yeah, very nice. So anyway, yeah. Um, you knew I was going to show some eight tracks off, right? Well, um, how, how could you not, for God's sakes? I kind of have to, yeah. And what's interesting about this album is that this was produced by Bruce Fairburn and Paul Dean, uh, assistant engineer David Ogilvie. Bob Rock is not credited on this one, and I wonder if that's because at that time Bob Rock was a member of the band The Paolas, which were, um, I don't know how you describe them, kind of a new wavy band kind of police-ish maybe and they <clears throat> for a couple of years in canada had quite a few hits most notably a song called eyes of a stranger uh which is kind of a reggae influenced song so um so bob rock wasn't involved with this one but it, it doesn't sound that much different big hit no. off this was mm-hmm. girls in love um another top 40 single queen of the broken hearts love that one i think this has some really strong album tracks on it i absolutely love prime of your life that's one of my favorites by them i like one-sided love affair it's never easy oh, to yeah. back. that should have been a hit mm-hmm. uh it's a strike zone chance of a lifetime this is a great album i mean this is prime prime lover boy and i didn't get the record out but grant this is this is the only record i've ever found used that came with an interview it came with a with a printed interview with Paul. Was it Dean. a promo? Was it a promo? No, every copy I've ever seen of it had it, it, the oh. sleeve. It has right. the lyrics and credits on one side, and then an interview with Paul Dean on another. And I've That'd talked to other damn. people that, and uh, it's got an interview with him about, I guess, the current what was going on at that point. But anyway, this is a great album. This is one that I find you find this one a lot. Um, this shows up used, mm-hmm. and uh, do yourself a favor and pick it up because it's a good, good album. I mean, it. it's not at the level, or even though we haven't talked about Get Lucky yet, but probably spoiling everything. But if you haven't figured it out by now, by it's now, pretty high on my app, I'm sure. <laughs> but the thing about Keep It Up is that maybe it's not quite as strong as Get Lucky, but I think Keep It Up is a much more balanced record. And a record as a whole, yeah, I think it thing- probably uh, <clears throat> translates better. If you know I what I mean, it, as an it's, album, it, it's not overshadowed. Like it had a hit single, had another minor hit single. Those right. do not overshadow the rest of the album. Correct. They don't take all the, they don't suck all the energy from the rest of the album. It right. hangs together as a good nine song collection of songs. This is just a good night. Exactly. So yep. I rated this higher because of that, but that's okay. This is all yep. good. All right. Excellent temp. Jesus, you and I on a ranking show is like a. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. My number three, I'm going to go with the first Loverboy album. And uh, Tim's already covered it. But, you know, you've got The Kid Is Hot Tonight, Turn Me Loose, which right there, for God's sakes, is enough to send you over the edge. Yeah. Always on my mind's decent lady of the 80s. It's cheesy keyboards on that song. <laughs> but the uh, Dean's uh, Paul Dean's slide playing on this is good. It gets in your head though that <laughs> it's 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 a terrible thing, but it does. <laughs> but this thing is so front loaded that yeah. by the time you get to side two, there's no life left. And this is why uh, I, you say, well, Grant, why is it so high? Because it's got kid kid is hot tonight and turn me loose, which are powerhouses. Um, the other tracks that I like is DOA, which I think is the best track on side two. Um, it it don't matter, which basically, oh, it's got a great chorus, great. It's a catchy song. It makes you long for the second album after this. It's this record. We talked about it before. It's very new wavy sounding to me. It's the perfect blend of new wave and 70s style rock. I don't know anybody else who had really had done it up to this point. This is probably a perfect example. Yeah. There's great songs on here, but I think they have a ways to go. Well, and that's why, yeah, I mean, those first two songs are so 
you know, they're, they're, they're all time classics. And that's why it was hard for me to rate it as low as I did. But at the same time, I had to look at it as an album. I mean, and, for, and as an album, I just find it's not as strong as what I rated high in my right. opinion. I got it. It's, I get it. Uh, a lot of people rate this album way higher. Some think this is the best lover boy album ever. Yeah. Yep. It is what it is. All right. I don't know, and, and I wonder about how many, like how many people, they just remember those two big songs. Like, well, it's gotta be good. And it is good. Right. Yeah. So here's, uh, here's where we do. Here's where. Oh we're God, here we go. Um, you know, what's coming. I know um, what's coming. My number two. Is love and every minute of it, nineteen eighty five. Holy for God's sakes! On this oh, lovely, oh green, my God, green colored cart here. Uh, the guys Tim are all darling. Are you feeling okay? For God's this sakes, this is when, like, this is when I first started really listening to Top Forty Radio and paying attention to who sang what. So, okay. love and every minute of it. I remember when it was new. <laughs> I at the time, I I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready for like heavy heavy bands mm -hmm. but i liked a little guitar and so this came on the radio yeah. like um i just thought it was cool i don't have a problem with the gang vocals yes this is a mutt lang song this could have been a Def leopard song yeah. heck with not much too much tweaking it could be a shania twain song it's mutt lang through and through um i've always wondered if it was um if it was something that was he had, was going to you know, if it was going to end up a Def Leppard song, I don't know. I didn't know that for many years, but when I found out who actually, like when I got the, uh, when I started looking at the songwriting credits, it's like, well, of course this is a Mutt Lang song. What else could it be? Of course. Um, and I like Friday Night. It's a fast rock yeah. or Steal the Thunder. Yeah. Tom Allen's production is, um, it's not as crisp as, um, as Bruce Fairburn, but, and it doesn't even sound like, Tom Allen, like when I think of Tom Allen, of course, me being the big Y&T fan, I think of In Rock We Trust. He produced that album. But this sounds more like that sort of muffly, muffled snare drum sound mm -hmm. that he got for Judas Priest. If you think of like you got another thing coming or living after, well, not maybe living after midnight, but the uh, Screaming for Vengeance, Defenders of Faith sound, that kind of mm -hmm. wet drum sound. That's yeah, the, yeah, yeah, it and, is. Uh, oh, 100% correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this could be the night's a great ballad. I love uh, Paul Dean's solo in it too. Um, I hate the edited version of it. It's interesting. Um, there's a throwback song on here that could have been on the first album. And it wouldn't surprise me to find it was written for the first album. That's Lead a Double Life. That mm -hmm. was the fourth single from the album. It did not chart. That's very new wavy sounding. That wouldn't, yeah. that was found out of place on side two of the first record. I think um, I, you know what, Tim? I think I wrote that down because I'm going, what? Because it's this that different. track doesn't, doesn't seem to yeah, fit. Yeah, doesn't sound like anything else on here. Now I got to say I love "Dangerous," which was the second single. It wasn't successful. Now this is another uh, this is another Brian Adams Jim Valance song. But this is a case of the band taking a song and making it better because this song was originally written by Brian Adams and Jim Valance as the title song from Reckless. And if you get the 30th anniversary edition of Reckless, you'll hear his original demo. And and Loverboy's version is, they just learned the demo. It's the same song. But by changing Reckless to Dangerous, and I'm not going to sing it, but it sings better because it's got three syllables. And it's a minor difference, but I can hear that the way that it was, it was a good song, but it was like, yeah, it's not strong enough to be the title song of this album. It's got so many great songs on it already. And so Loverboy took it and they made it, it sound it, it, like, it, they were like kindred spirits. So it's like Loverboy covering a Brian Adams song doesn't sound out of place. It sounds like something they may have come up with on their own. I really like Destination Heartbreak. I think that could have been a single. It's another ballad, but it could have been a single in its own right. Yeah, I I, I do like this album quite a bit, but I, I you know, um, it was, like I said, one of the first real rock bands I get into. So um, I, I think the singles still hold up and i am okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not i don't really have any problem with with the album tracks either so that's right. my number two way up here so so far ladies and there. gentlemen when you see our rankings that are all over the place that indicates that really there's a lot of great material here with and it's only, boy it, you know what it's mainly because of this album and what we each think of it that's mm -hmm. thrown our rankings off other than that they really aren't that different but still you can hear it one way, I can hear it another. Yep. So, you know, 
take it for what it is. We, I would rather people just to say, wow, you guys look at you and just listen for yourself, leave a comment, let us know what yeah. you think. Cause we do want to know. All right. So what, did, what am I on? Number two. You're on your number two. All right. My number two is keep it up. Came out yeah. in 1983. Great album. <laughs> Reached number seven on the billboard 200. This record continues on where get lucky left off to me when i listen to this tim it sounds they could be the same record the tonality of both records are the same it's like it's like boston and the don't look back it just sounds like the next logical step the next bunch of songs right but the thing is that this album's more consistent there are there's less big huge gigantic songs on this record as opposed to get lucky but as a whole, as a record, as an album listening experience, it's probably a little bit more satisfying. That's what I'm trying to say. You've got Hot Girls in Love, which was a killer, killer song. Kind of a dumb title, kind of a dumb song, but come on, you can't. They sell it, though. Like the, the, They the band sell, sell it. The video, the video is so ridiculous. They're like Matt Fredette's playing with like gas gas yeah. nozzles and 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 i like the fact that when lover boy got inducted into the juno hall of fame and i'm gonna say 2010 i could be off by a year but right. among the thank yous he was self-aware enough to say and i want to thank mtv and much music for playing our silly videos yeah. and they were pretty silly videos but people watch them and they remember they remember that image right they do so um strike zone yeah experimental intro it's kind of like fantasy from aldo nova heavy riffs great great vocals from reno yeah i could almost hear this like being in a film somewhere but it's not uh it's never easy we finally get a a a lover boy ballad and reno then nails it yeah great songwriting here great chord changes in it Uh, i mean i could keep going queen of, of the broken hearts kind of a lesser known hit but my that's got God. the that's got the uh the uh doug johnson on the vocoder yeah. you know tell me what kind of girl would you that <laughs> which kind of dates it but the song is strong it's, it's still strong fun, though yeah uh prime of your love i just want to say how it sounds very solid state because any guitar players out there you know what a solid st- well back in the day it doesn't really have that warmth but it the song almost sounds robotic the keys are great doug johnson Hitting it out of the park. This is the other thing I want to mention on this record is that the keyboards dominate, which I like because I think Doug as a keyboardist and what he brings to the table kill and it kills on this record. This is my number two for God's sake. He's always really good at picking the right sounds that he doesn't use the same, you know, keyboard patches for, for every song. He's really good. And he's still like really good at it. The only thing I think is interesting now is when you see these older bands, you know, you see the old videos and they've got, here's a keyboard, here's right. a keyboard, here's right. a keyboard. Well, now they can do everything with one and just hit a couple buttons. And <laughs> yeah. The old days, not like that. So anyway, yeah. that's my number two. I could keep going because I, and I just want to say this, Tim, before we go on, is that this is one of those records I wasn't that familiar with. I kind of lost track of them, but then I revisited it. And this is one of those records that you can listen to over and over and you can pick out more things in it. Because you would think, man, by the third record, they'd have to be running out of steam. But I don't know. There's something magical about this record. Is it the producer? Is it Bruce being on board? I don't know what it is. I don't know. They this just, is they, one they of the great whatever records. Whatever they had was working for them. Like, was like working. I said, like, and, and four platinum records in a row in the States. Like, Which is amazing. Unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of. Un- that's un- quite un- a run. So everybody knows now we've talked about everything but. Our number so one. they got the same number one. There's no doubt this is yeah, the number one. It's got to be. Yeah, get lucky. Uh, yeah. Reached number seven on the Billboard 200 chart. It was on the chart, Tim, for two years in the States. I know. Sold over four, four million, million copies. In the States. Four million. Like, for people to think that, you know, if anybody, oh, lover boy, they want that. They, no, they had a four million selling album. Yeah. Um, and, so and, got, and, and I got to tell you, you go to see them in concert, you're going to hear more songs from this. Right. than any other album obviously well, it's like it's, the greatest hits unto itself it is working for the weekend when it's over take me to the top lucky ones and jump were all singles from this record and yeah. all those songs are worthy um yeah. 
I mean, if you listen to the way the album starts out, working for the weekend starts off that cowbell. Yeah. How iconic. Anybody in that's ever heard it, if you hear yeah. that cowbell count off, you, you know, know what what's is. coming. Exactly. It's when so when it's it, over. God dang, that's great. Working for the weekend is one of those weird songs, Grant, that that its popularity um doesn't equal its chart position because I think it only hit like 26 on the chart. Yeah. But it's pop culture. Everybody knows that song. It became a catchphrase. Just how you making out? Oh, I'm just working for the weekend. Like it's like life in the fast lane. Like it's it, they they invented a catchphrase. Yeah, and it took off. And it's Everybody, still a fun song to listen to. I never get tired of it. People could I could identify with it. Yeah. They were working towards a weekend. My God, how could they time it any better? It was perfect. Yeah. But I, I mean, I jump. can't go on. Jump's great. Brian Adams that's a, song. That's, that's a Brian Adams song, but it's just so fun and, and upbeat and bouncy and well, it, it sounds like its name. And, um, you know, when it's over is a great. I don't know if you, know, if you call it a power ballad, but I mean, it's, it's sure is good. Yeah, it's great. Lucky ones, lucky ones, classic. One of the best Lover Boy song. songs ever. I yeah, might be my notes. favorite Lover Boy song ever. There ever. you go. It's it's heavy. To the top. Yeah, take me to the top is fantastic. Um, I, what I think is really funny, Grant, is that you had Motley Crue, mm -hmm. Lover Boy, and Cheap Trick in the '80s. They all had songs called "Take Me to the Top," and they're all completely different songs. That's such a specific title, but they they managed to use it in three different ways. This is the first one I heard, and I still think it's the best. I still I think this is the best too. This is. Well, Take Me to the Top is probably one of my... Well, there's a lot of my favorite Loverboy songs on this record. You know, I mentioned that the you know the following record I thought was a little bit more... Uh, what do I want to say? Brain balanced. Problem. Balanced. Because, you know, some of the weaker songs on this record, while they're weak... Well, look at... Tim, for God's sakes, look at the tracks on here. Yeah. If you're going to have a weak song, it's really going to be co contrasted with the greatness... It's that's on by here. comparison right like right you know like not not everybody you know not everybody thinks it's a good idea for paul dean to take the lead like he does with emotion see but that's, that's kind of a, but whatever that's kind of a fun you know stonesy kind of song you know honky tonk piano or whatever i like watch out i mean i think that's a that's a catchy song that could have been a single you know they still do it's your life in concert that's the, the, the both times i've seen them, they did it's your life it's I'm a like, great that's song odd, that's an odd song to bring out but i'm glad they did lover um, boy avoided the sophomore slump yeah, gangs in the street. Totally. Gangs in the streets almost like another turn me loose because it's got that do 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 do. It's like driven by the bass. And I just came up with another topic for our discussion: bands that avoided the sophomore slump. This yeah, is a no, perfect is example. Any, well, they literally doubled sales of their first album. Their first album sold two million. Yeah, like this. You know, this solidified their career. So they. They put this album out. They had a lot of radio play. They they opened for Journey on the Escape Tour, mm -hmm. like this, you know. And there's a reason this was on the charts for two years. It's a good album, and and it made it into a lot of homes. <laughs> so yeah, I had a feeling. I mean, I can't. I would have been surprised if if both of us had picked anything else other than Get Lucky for the best one because it's just kind of front and center. There it is, yeah, song for song. All right. Cool. There you go. Two yeah. our same number ones. Even though our ranking was a little bit different. Hey, all we're trying to do is talk music and trying to get Loverboy out there. And just let us know what you think in the comments. What you like, what you don't like. Are we out of our minds with our ranking? I think we're pretty good. There's variation, but that just goes to show you that this is really is a strong catalog. Yeah. Well worth listening to and checking out. So and if you want those other songs we were talking about, those straight ones, you got to get big ones. Mm -hmm. You got to get a uh, 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 rock and roll revival. And then one they put it in 2016 that's called Cream. Each one of those releases have three brand new songs that weren't on any other album. So there's an equivalent of a nine song album with those three, D, three CDs. All right, cool. All right, Tim Derling, there's our ranking. Lover Boy, the, who is talking Lover Boy? Well, we are in the warehouse. That's, that's I want to thank. We do. That's what we do. I want to thank Tim Derling for coming on. We need to get Tim back in here to rank something else because this was a lot of fun, ladies and gentlemen. So, Tim, I want to appreciate you coming on. God, this is great. Uh, is there anything you want to 
promote or anything before we get out of here? Anything coming well, up on the as, channel? As Grant, because I'm going to try knows, to get this out pretty fast. So, as Grant knows, uh, and he's he's contributed, I am working on something. I'm not ready to reveal it just yet. Okay. Uh, as of right now, our YNT deep dive continues. That's getting a lot of positive feedback. People are agreeing. People are disagreeing. It's our good friend John the Music Nut, who's on every channel. That guy never stops. But uh, that's yeah, true. People enjoy revisiting that catalog. You know, lately I've been doing a lot of interviewing authors. Uh, which is a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, I do two episodes a week and uh, all anyone has to do is look for Tim's Final Confessions on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. And uh, my books are available on Amazon. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, the link's down below, ladies and gentlemen. This was a lot of fun, Tim. I want to thank you for doing it. Thanks for having me. All right.